Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply, and this video is to bring you a closer look at the Stanley. This is their part number 327. This is a pivot in a um, US 10B finish. I <clears throat> admittedly don't sell this pivot often in oil rub bronze um, for a number of reasons, I suppose. But, um, you know, it could be that 10B is just, it's certainly not as popular as it once was. There was a time when it was all the rage. It has been currently replaced by black as being all the rage. Um, <clears throat> quite frankly, I would be racing to offer this in black if I was the manufacturer. This is clearly a sprayed finish um, and is not going to be necessarily... Um, you know, it's complementary to oil rub bronze. Um, and the fact of the matter is you see very little of this hardware anyway when the door is installed. Okay. So this is a, th a Stanley uh, 327 pivot. This is one of, this is part of a relatively small family of pivots that they have available. And, wow, that's so great. They have actually new installation instructions. And while it's dated still 1977, they're larger so that you can actually read the dimensions. There were some dimensions historically that I really couldn't make out very well. Well, that's just great. So let's take a closer look at what we have. What we'll do is start this video with a visual tour of what's in the box, obviously installation instructions. Uh, you're going, th these are non-handed, so you're going to have you know, a set of pivots top and bottom. And when you order one, you're getting a set of pivots. In fact, pivots are always sold as a set um, that I can think of, unless you specifically add part numbers to mean I don't want the whole set. Um, so a question we get, you know, oh, I'm ordering these pivots, do I get a top and a bottom? Yeah, you do. Uh, certainly with all of the Stanley pivots. Um, you cannot buy just a half of set of these. Other manufacturers, you can buy the you know, bottom only, or you can buy the pivot set and then specify less top or less bottom pivot. It'd be really less top pivot. If you needed the top pivot, you could order only the top pivot, really. Um, so this is a 327. It's a set, a complete set to hang a door. There are links down below, which we'll get to. Let's go to the extended description first. This is what they call a US 10BL dark oxidized satin bronze. Um, this will be made of steel, certainly. Um, I'm going to think that this is powder coated, um, but I'm not an expert in terms of finishing, but I don't know how else they would get this on there. And it is an equivalent to oil rub bronze. This is intended for overlay doors, inch and three eighths to inch and three quarter. Let's back up. The word overlay we're going to define. Um, this is for doors that are inch and three quarter inch and three eighths used in an overlay application which we'll define for doors not exceeding 150 pounds and what's really great about not only the door thickness range but the weight is that's going to handle you know pretty much anything you're going to contend with um, are you going to want to hang these on a 3080 um, wood door maybe uh, if you did using normal calculation for for weight per foot a uh, 3080 inch and three quarter solid core door is basically 150 pounds. Um, could be a few pounds more, could be a few pounds less, whatever the case might be. Uh, the point being is you can take this pivot set and basically handle um, pretty much any door you need. So in the sense that it's ideal for wardrobe doors, it certainly is. Um, but how big will a wardrobe door be? Will it be 3080? Could be 80. It's probably not going to be 3 You're probably going to be dealing with 18-inch doors, you know, 20-inch doors, inch and three-eighths. So these pivots are really ideal for that application in the sense that you're going to hide much of your hardware uh, is the bottom line. Designed to take vertical and lateral loads. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the design, the construction of this is going to bear the weight vertically. I mean, laterally, it, I would think that that's a reference to how this is constructed so that the hardware controls the door in a lateral sense. Designed for mullion or face frame mounting, and that has everything to do with the overlay application, which we'll talk about in a moment. Doors can be installed floor to ceiling, which means you're going to be able to really do as much as possible to maximize the overall, overall door height 
so that you bring that as as close into the ceiling height and into the down to the floor as possible. Close off those areas. The screw holes allow for vertical and lateral adjustment. You'll be able to move this harder a little bit this way. You'll be able to move the door this way a little bit. Okay. Doors can go to 180 degree. Unless there's something preventing it from happening, these doors will go at least to 180 degree. You might have some base, some trim, some sort of condition on the wall that would prevent you from going 180, but usually not. They are non-handed. They can easily be just flipped over. Let's move towards the product catalog now. The product catalog is nice because it's going to allow us to look at that relatively small family. There's, you know, maybe four pivots that are available. And, you know, the only, the only downside of these pivots, if you're going to try to use them on full-size doors, there's no, this is an offset pivot, right? So the vertical axis of pivoting is offset from the face of the door. Whatever that dimension is, is obviously based on door thickness, etc. But, there's no concept of an intermediate pivot on this hardware. And, you know, how would they elegantly go about doing that without making some very odd prep to the door and frame or to the door itself would have to be thought through. The point being is an intermediate pivot is what's going to keep the door... Um, any Any giddy up that it develops any warp okay is not going to be mitigated uh, because there is no intermediate pivot um, I don't bump into the lack of an intermediate pivot as a problem on these doors but it is accurate to say that should your door warp at all and you contact the wood door manufacturer and they ask you how have you hung the door on Stanley 327's so when you tell them it's Stanley 327s, they're going to say, well, that's improperly hung. In the sense that it's not improperly hung, but it does not meet the criteria by which a door is going to be found compliant with a warranty. So there is that caveat that I'll talk to people when we're talking about doors of this nature. Um, I don't run into it. So if I sell a hundred of these pivots, hardly zero, almost zero percent of the time, is this conversation happening about, okay, there's no intermediate pivot if it warps. Now, let's get to the product catalog. As you scroll through, you're going to get to an overview of Stanley, et cetera, et cetera. They are certainly as big of a part of the explosion of the manufacturing of door hardware in the United States mid-19th century. That part of New England was the home, that general area was the home of so many major players. Many exist today. Sargent. Corbin Russwin, obviously Stanley, um, uh, came out of that part of New England. Anyway, uh, the first pivot we look at is the 340 and the 341. These are just variations on um, how the material mounts. As you're thinking about what pivot are you going to use, I would be looking at how thick of a door the pivot's compatible with and how heavy of a door the pivot's compatible with. So if you're dealing with inch and three-quarter thick doors, um, you immediately get to the 327 and then you stay there, okay? So if it's inch and three quarter, you don't have any other options. If it's inch and three eighths, you can look at the other uh, part uh, uh, pivots they have. In particular, the 342 is going to mount like the 327 in the fact that it's overlay or to a mullion, um, but it's for doors that are half of the weight capacity. So be mindful. Probably how heavy is your door and how thick is your door, and then judge from there. So that catalog will allow you to review the uh, cabinet and wardrobe hardware that Stanley offers. The name is, you know, these, these pivots have been manufactured for decades. Um, and focusing on the 327, we get into a lot of, we get into all the same information that we just discussed in the extended description. We also get into some dimensional properties. Um, the gauge of the steel is also listed there. The screws that are included, um, how many come in a case, and what's the weight of that case, naturally. Then we really move into the cut sheet, uh, which is going to be um, 
literally the same document except that it's that one page lifted out to be made available to you to forward to a client that you might need to elegantly show them this is the hardware I'm talking about rather than giving them an entire catalog. You don't need to do that. It would not be best practice to send more information than necessary. It would not be best practice to send information not requested. Then the installation instructions, and that's really the meat and potatoes of this video, and let's move to those right now. Now let us take a look at the installation instructions, and they are linked to down below this video. And You know, they're simple and straightforward in the sense that, you know, if you've if you've never installed this hardware before, I would take the time to fully read the installation instructions and then go back and do a reality check. Make sure everything makes sense to what you are thinking and expecting. But it, it is not this hardware is nothing to shy away from in terms of complexity. Um, it's not intro, but it's let's just say it's level two. And after you do your first one or your first pair. You're going to be an expert at it. So we talked about the term overlay and that we would define that. When you look at step one, they're defining overlay. Uh, if you are looking for this kind of hardware, you're probably familiar with cabinet doors where you can have an overlay, you can have an inset, you can have a partial or a semi overlay, a full wrap and other terms that apply to cabinet doors and their hinges. Well, when it's an overlay, you're basically taking the door and putting it on top of the casework. You're not fitting it inside, which would be an inset. So you're doing an overlay. You don't have an option to install this really any other way um, other than an overlay because of the type of hardware that it is. You need to apply this surface mounted would be a good way to think of it. Cabinet doors are very often overlay applications. And in fact, I would certainly think that residential cabinetry is is almost always overlay uh, where the door is larger than the opening. Now what we had also talked about is the fact that you can install this on a mullion um, and a mullion would be a term that would be used mullion and stop or mullion and jam stop. If you have an opening and you want to insert this into the opening, you can. So the face of the door is flush with the face of the wall or jam, whatever it is, it would be a wall. And that is, I think, really the more common way to install this. Let's get a let's get let's make a quick sketch. So what we have here is our opening. And you know, we're gonna take our door and we're gonna fit it inside of here. Certainly no problem with doing that, except that you need somewhere to attach that hardware to. Okay, so what you'll have to add, it will be a stop. You'll have to add some material so that you can mortise your pivot to. Okay, that's why you'll see this as an overlay because then you're going to attach it right to the face of the opening. Now, if it was a mullion application, if you're going to do an inset, mullion application I've I'm drawing this grossly out of scale so forgive me here's a here's here's a double door your jam stop material but then on these other doors you've got to have some mullion that's the mullion. It's the same thing as, as the jam stops, except that that piece of material is going to run floor to ceiling and give you something to attach that material to. And obviously it's going to be wider than your jam stop because you've got to install two pieces of equipment there. But that's jam, jam stop, uh, mullion. You know, that's, that's where those terms come from uh, because they do refer to a mullion. Um, I would not call it a mullion in a single door or just a pair of doors. I'd call that a jam stop is what I would call it. The instructions given, step one, the instructions given are for an overlay installation using a 327 pivot hinge set mounted right hand. The 327 is reversible, not handed, just flip everything over. Step two talks about the face of the mullion 
but that can also be a reference to the face of the opening itself with what we need to do next. As we move to step two, we're going to get into um, basically the important part of step two is actually marking on the face of the mullion or whatever you're attaching this to a vertical line that will come into play later on. You do want to to give you that line. So on the face of the mullion, um, mark vertical lines on the face of the mullion in order to horizontally horizontally position mullion leaves. Horizontal positioning will vary with mullion width. An inch and a quarter wide mullion with mullion leaves centered horizontally is the minimum width recommended. Amount of overlay of the door will vary with mullion width and design requirements. An inch and three sixteenths overlay on the hinge side is minimum. Uh, yeah, that's going to be because you need, you know, you need enough room to be able to actually get that installed. An inch and three sixteenths would be the minimum. The hardware itself is inch and an eighth. Okay, so a minimum dimension they're saying of inch and a quarter uh, or inch and a quarter mullion uh, would certainly make sense if you're going to center this on that mullion. Step three, they want you to mortise as shown on top and bottom of door if minimum vertical clearance is desired. So they're showing an L-shaped prep that you're going to do at the top and the bottom of the door um, for the hardware. So let's take a look at what they're asking us to do here. So they want inch and an eighth from the, he from the heel of the door, and that's obviously going to account for the portion of the pivot to breach the face of the door. And that's indeed inch and an eighth. That's what we're seeing. Okay. They want you to go all the way back through the door itself. There's um, going to be no way around that um, at all uh, because your door needs to sit on the back side of this leaf. So you're going to mortise it all the way through. Uh, then they want three inch in length, and that's going to be for this aspect, which is three inch. Um, nothing else to give you. They're giving you how wide the prep is. They're giving you how long it is. They're telling you that it's inch and an eighth and then all the way through the thickness of the door. There's one other note comment. If you look right here at the tip of my finger, that's a 90 degree bend, but the inside of that corner is not a tight inside angle. There is a, there is a, um, because of the machining process or the, the, uh, press break that's bending this material or however they're doing it that re that leaves a radius on the inside of here they're saying make a 3 16th approximate chamfer on the inside bottom and top of door to accommodate door leaf bend so you're going to take the 3 inch wide on the inside face of the door top and bottom and you're going to take that down 3 16th a file uh, would be okay to do that with um, you know I wouldn't use a belt sander to do it. I would want to do it a little carefully <laughs> uh, to do that. Um, you know, you might also uh, consider doing it with a router bit, uh, but you're going to need to break that edge. 3 16 is not a lot, although that's a lot to put a hand chamfer on. So you might want to get that started with a file uh, because you need this plate to obviously be tight if this was the top of the door but you need this plate to be tight on the back side of the door, and that's what that chamfer is for. Mortising may be eliminated if approximately half-inch clearance at top and bottom is acceptable. So what they're saying there is, obviously all of this is where that half-inch is coming in, or coming to play, coming in, com coming from. Um, assuming that you want to make this as tight as possible, you're going to mortise that material. What they don't tell us, though, is how deep to make the prep. That's obviously going to be a reference to the thickness of the hinge. And my caliper is telling me 0 0.199. 0 0.199 is what this is. So to make that all flush, or the top of your door to come to this dimension right here, you need to mortise that deep. I'm, I'm surprised I'm not seeing that. They're not telling us how deep to make it. Um, you know, so the decision has to be made how deep will you mortise it? You know, how much of this hardware is going to not be in, uh, taken up by the door? If you were to mortise that
and that is 0.485. If you were to mortise that a half of an inch, your door is going to come all the way up to the top here. And the fact of the matter is, um, probably no problem with that at all, right? Imagine your door being flush to the top of this piece, and that door swings out. Okay, your this is going to come right up to your ceiling, and therefore your door is as well. So, you know, you're going to mortise it flush for this. You're going to take it all the way to the top, which would be typical for this hardware. And that's where that half inch reference is coming, um, coming from in terms of maybe backing into it. If you're okay with a half inch gap top and bottom, don't mortise anything. Uh, but otherwise, you're going to mortise it flush to the face of this, which is basically a half of an inch. Moving to step four, you've got your preparations done, top and bottom. I've prepped for this sort of hardware in the past. Um, I'm going to use a template, a router, and a router bit every single time. Um, if I was doing one door and I was never going to do one of these again, I might consider a hammer and a chisel. But that is no... I would take the hour that I would need to make the template so that I could get that perfect preparation out of this then go back and square the corners. That's a lot of material to try to take a half of an inch off of and do so very flatly. Um, you know, we all use the tools, I suppose, that we, we gravitate towards what we're skilled at. Not that I'm skilled with a router, but that would be my weapon of choice to prep this regardless. Plus, in my experience or in my exposure in the industry, I'm not making it for myself. I'm manufacturing the door and prepping the door, machining the door to present to a client. Hammer and chisel, that's not going to be that presentable in my opinion. Step four, place door leaves in mortise, mark and pre-drill at center of the elongated holes. That's just going to be this guy right here. Mark at the center, pre-drill that hole. That's all you do top and bottom because that's where it's going to start to come into importance of that vertical line you struck back in step two, which is step five. Step five, to allow for vertical adjustment and sufficient clearance under the door, the bottom mullion leaf should be mounted at least a quarter inch off the floor. Sure. So what they're saying there is, and we're going to get to a formula or a dimension in a little bit, and, and you've not really obviously done anything to the door until we've gone over the installation instructions. But what sort of gap do you want from the bottom of the door to your floor? They're saying a quarter inch minimum. Why? Well, not a, you know, no floor is level. You might have a floor that kind of goes away from your opening so that when you open your door to 60 degrees, you're scraping on the floor. So you need to kind of analyze that and decide when you, inst when you line up your pivot hardware on your jam and you line this against your mark, what are you leaving underneath? You're going to put a quarter inch uh, piece of shim material down there to build that off? Okay, great, but that decision has to be made. Um, to allow for vertical adjustment and sufficient clearance under the door, the bottom mullion leaf should be mounted at least a quarter inch off the floor. If carpet or other special floor coverings are used, Additional clearance should be allowed equal to that thickness. So if you've got a half inch shag, you're going to need three quarter inch margin is the bottom line. Preserve that quarter inch originally. And play with that dimension only if you absolutely know your floor is perfectly level or at least goes away from your door. And then maybe tighten that up to three sixteenths. But, you know, you don't want to have to unhang the door to belt sand or cut part of the door down because that will, that will affect everything. Apply bottom hinge to face of mullion using the center of the elongated hole. Be sure to line up with the previous drilled, pardon me, previously drawn vertical uh, line. Now you're going to pre-drill a hole through this elongated hole. Okay. Uh, step six is where the question comes in. Okay, what size do I make my door? Um, you're not there yet, so it's okay. But you probably want to know that. What you know. I need to order some doors before I can order the hardware. What size am I going to order? Step six, position top hinge mullion, le top hinge mullion leaf on mullion at a point from the top of the bottom hinge, which is equal to door height less five and seven sixteenths. Okay. So position the top hinge mullion leaf on the mullion at a point from the top of the bottom hinge, from the top of the bottom hinge, 
from the top of the bottom hinge here, which is going to be your door height less 5 and 7 sixteenths. So whatever your door height is, these need to be that height less 5 and 7 sixteenths measured from here to here. That's what that is. Note, if not mortising the door leaves, then the dimension of the door height is minus 5 and 1 16th, 1 16th of an inch, because you've surface mounted something. Okay. Apply screw in the center of the elongated hole. You're going to do that top and bottom now. Uh, you've got holes pre-drilled top and bottom. Your screw will go in the center of the elongated hole, and that's because we want to be able to tailor that should we need to. Before tightening, raise the top hinge to the utter uppermost position and temporarily tighten the screw. Okay. So now what you have is a shim underneath the bottom pivot. You've got your hardware attached with a screw through the elongated slot, top and bottom. You've got a hole that's pre-drilled in the back of your door because we did that in step four. Open the bottom leaf to 180 degrees, so get that and swing it out. Your door is going to go inside of here. Locate the bottom mortise on the bottom hinge. Apply the screw through that elongated hole right in the center. In the same way, locate the top door mortise on top hinge door leaf by dropping uh, top jam leaf. Apply screw into the pre-drilled hole. So your door is going to get brought into position. You're obviously going to be shimming it so you're not hanging it on these on the bottom pivot that's on one loose screw. Get that held up in position. Get your screws tightened to the back of the door and then at that point you can start to carefully test your door for operation. Step eight, make final door alignment if necessary by tapping the leaves that have elongated holes with your mallet. Move it over, whatever needs to be done. If substantial horizontal adjustment is necessary, additional mortising may be required. That will become obvious to you because your door just won't work the way you want it to. Once you have it where you want it, then you will pre-drill and then apply your screws through the fixed holes, and the fixed holes will then prevent any movement from happening. But those elongated holes are there for you to make your lateral adjustment and your vertical adjustment, in fact. Okay. One thing we didn't talk about is what color, other colors these are available in. Um, and let's take a look at that now. I know, I believe there's four. Obviously, oil rub bronze. There's going to be polished brass. There's going to be maybe five. Oh, no, maybe more than that. Here we go. Polished chrome, satin chrome, satin bronze, oil rub bronze, polished brass, prime coat. Yep, you can do it in those, I think that was six different finishes. Polished brass is the most common. Um, I think, well, maybe maybe satin chrome would be. But we've sold all of them. Um, satin bronze we do sell, uh, not uncommon. Prime coat's not uncommon either because people like to strip that down or to do some sort of painting on the material themselves, uh, a finish that can't be otherwise supplied. Um, so it's a really great little pivot set, and after you've gone through the installation instructions, it really doesn't become um, very deep, very difficult. Well, the only thing that you have to, you know, you have to make a couple of decisions. How much am I going to mortise? They're assuming you're going to make that flush with the top of the door and at the bottom. You're going to pad that off the floor a quarter inch or whatever undercut you need to have. You know, determine how you're going to mortise the door and frame, uh, and then go from there. Okay, so the overall height of your door, you know, we're dealing with the overall height of your opening, assuming it's going to be inset. If it's overlay, you know, you're not so critical, but if it's going to be, if it's going to be an inset application, you need to think about how much, how deep am I going to mortise the pivot hardware so that I achieve the margin that I need between the top of the door and the underside of the opening and then from the bottom of the door to the floor. So there will have to be a certain deduct from the finished opening size to that net door size. And you'll simply lay all that out. I would imagine if it's an inset, you're going to want an eighth of an inch at the top. Okay, um, At the bottom, let's just say you stick with a quarter inch. So you know that your net door height is going to have to be that finished opening size less three-eighths. Um, in terms of your width, 
you know, I would leave an eighth of an inch and an eighth of an inch, that sort of business. Um, I think you'd be in real good shape at that point. Beveling the door um, is certainly a good idea. You'll be able to increase that door width a little bit, maybe a, uh, by a sixteenth of an inch, but it will bring you a tighter margin. But an eighth of an inch works, leave it at it as an eighth, eighth of an inch so that, ma so that it not only matches what you're doing at the header, but that's standard residential carpentry as well. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. There is a link below this video to the manufacturer's page where you can pull up not only all of the Stanley products that we sell, but also a link to the manufacturer's website as well as a link to the full product catalog. I'm partial to Stanley and it's really because I am a huge fan of the caliber, quality, fit and finish of their architectural and commercial hinges. I think they've got the best hinge in the business, and I really say that because um, not, a, not only how deep they are in terms of being specified within the industry, but also when you just get that hinge, you look at it and say, now that looks like a hinge that's made by somebody who really knows how to manufacture hinges. Plus, in the front of their catalog, they have a lot of encyclopedic information about hinges, which to me is the hallmark of a good manufacturer because they're basically telling you, take a moment, read some of this. This is how hinges work. And that will then allow you to understand the hinge and then to apply that knowledge to solve your application problem. You know, full surface, wide throw, half mortise, I don't know, uh, anchor hinge. It's all listed there. Um, and they, they, uh, they enfranchise you, they enable you, they make that information accessible to you. Any questions on the 327 uh, pivot in any finish, this one's oil rub bronze or any other Stanley product, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you.